Hello everyone and welcome once again to Stitch Bliss Corner. Thank you to all who have subscribed to my channel. I'm amazed, thank you. And also anyone who's visiting for the first time, thank you for coming. Now today I'm going to talk about Mary's Queen of Scots and also about her life and times before I go on to her stitchery. Um, you know, you might think, well, why don't you just go straight on to the stitchery? But I think there is so much of what happened to Mary um, reflected in her work and also her ongoing battles with Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth I, who was her cousin. Um, anyway, so I thought to begin with, it would be good to just place her in history so that you can see where she came from and how she was related to Elizabeth and why Elizabeth saw her as such a threat to her kingdom. So here we have the family tree. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now we've got Henry the seventh up here because he had uh, four, ch four children Arthur who died so he's not on here but he had Henry and he had Margaret and he also had Mary Tudor and <clears throat> Henry went on to have Mary, that's Mary Tudor, not to be confused with Mary Queen of Scots. So Henry had Mary Tudor, Edward Tudor, and Elizabeth Tudor. They were all his children. And then Margaret Tudor, Henry's sister, married James, the oh, sorry, yes, the fourth of Scotland. And that union brought about James V of Scotland. And James V married Mary of Guise. And Mary of Guise was Mary Queen of Scots's mother. So that's how they're related. And that's why Elizabeth was always very concerned about what Mary was doing and where she was in the scale of things. Now I've written myself some questions here <laughs> to answer just to make it a bit easier for me because Mary's life was so turbulent and there were so many things going on often simultaneously that it's not possible to cover everything that happened to her and I don't want to do that anyway I'm trying to get to Mary the person. Um, so anyway she was born in Linlithgow Palace in Scotland in 1592 on December the 8th and she died in Fotheringay Castle in England in 1587 and she was 44. And I've been through who her parents were, James V of Scotland and Mar Murray of Guise and she was French from the big Guise powerful nobility. Um, now Mary's religion, she was a Roman Catholic which put her at odds immediately with Elizabeth because she was Protestant. So now Mary spent her childhood uh, in France. She became Queen of Scotland at six days old when her father died unexpectedly at around 33. And because she was so young and there was so much conflict going on between Scotland and England with um, different armies invading Scotland. Um, Mary of Guise, Mary's mother, decided to stay in Scotland as Queen Consort and to ally Mary with France because France has always been, had always been an ally of Scotland. So she sent her daughter to live in France uh, with the view to becoming Queen of France because she was betrothed to Francis, um, the Prince of France, 
Well, his father was Henry II, so he was still reigning at the time. But being his son, Mary being matched to him, eventually the crown would go to the son and she would be queen consort of France. Um, now, let's just go on. How was Mary received to the French court? Well, they thought she was amazingly sweet. You know, she was quite young, a little a child, and she went with her four ladies in waiting. Well, there were children in waiting, but they stayed with her for much of her life. And that was Mary Seaton, Mary Fleming, uh, Mary Livingston, and Mary Beaton. And together they were called the Four Marys. So imagine all those Marys. So of course, they were referred to by their last names to make it easier. And um, yes, Francois was not a very healthy child, um, but Mary mothered him and she had a motherly love for him and he was devoted to her. He absolutely adored Mary throughout his life. Now, Things took a turn in France because Henry's wife, uh, Catherine Medici, was a very jealous woman. She loved her husband very much, but he didn't love her. He uh, was very keen on Diane de Potier. I think I don't know how you say the French, <laughs> but anyway. Um, she was his mistress and Catherine was a bit twisted by all this and she resented Mary as well because of course when Francis became king Mary would um, take precedence at court over Catherine so she had no reason to want her to stay in France and what happened was Henry II was in a tournament and jousting and one of the spears from the end of the joust, you know, jousting stick, uh, pierced his eye, it went through his visor. And he got an infection in the brain and he died after nine or ten days. And of all of this was very unexpected, of course. So Francis then became king. So that went for a little while and then Francis himself died. He um, got an infection in his ear and that travelled to his brain. So then of course Catherine Medici was very keen to see the back of Mary and Mary then returned to Scotland. Um, now she was ill prepared really for it because she'd been indulged all her life at the French court and she had um, a retinue of French people with her, uh, which the Scottish people wouldn't have been too happy about, I should imagine. Um, although the common folk, as you might call them, they were enchanted by her. She was like a, I don't know, a fairy queen had turned up. You can imagine with all her finery and everything. Um, but anyway, so wait until I just go a little bit further here. Now, she was 18 when she came back to Scotland. And in the time she'd been away, her mother had died. And Mary's half-brother, that's James's, uh, the fifth's son, he was um, running Scotland as a consort, but, or a regent sort of thing, but he was not legitimate. So he had to hand over to Mary when she arrived, which you can imagine he wasn't happy about that because he was Protestant and she was Catholic. So that became a problem, although he did protect her to a degree to begin with because the way he looked at it, he thought, oh, well, she can be the figurehead and I'll still run the place, but she can look pretty and sit in a corner. <laughs> but I mean, that wasn't what Mary was about. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, so just to move along a bit. Uh, 
Yeah, so I'm just moving through here. I've got some pictures of all these people shortly that I can show you. This is just to give you a background to all these different characters. Um, now, her brother, when Mary arrived and settled in and everything, um, her brother was quietly behind the scenes destabilising her, well, appearing to support her. Naturally enough, he didn't want to destabilise her so much that the whole region descended into chaos. Um, so he had to walk a, a fine line. But he worked really in, um, in sync with Elizabeth in England. You know, he was quietly doing the sorts of things that he knew she would approve of because he wanted her support. Um, now, after a while, um, I think it was Mary sent a message to Elizabeth because she wanted to get married again and she was casting about for her husband and she asked Elizabeth if she would mind if she married a foreign uh, king or prince and Elizabeth replied that it, she would consider it an unfriendly act. <laughs> so, or she let that be known anyway through diplomatic circles to Mary that that really wasn't a goer. So then Mary looked around and found someone, Lord Darnley. Now Darnley is also on the family tree here because he was descended on the Stuart side. I won't show you that but anyway he he was he does have a claim to royalty himself so anyway he married Darnley oh sorry she married Darnley and I think what happened was Mary was a very passionate woman and she'd already been married and I think she thought if she found someone that was devoted to her then he would be a good counterpoint to her half-brother because I think she was starting to realise that he wasn't fully on her side. So she decided on Darnley because he had the royal descent um, in his blood and he did make a big fuss of her. But then as soon as he married her, he kind of changed overnight and became a really uh, unpleasant individual that insisted that he should be king now that he was married to her even though she'd pointed out to him that he was only going to be called queen, king, he would never be king because he was only there because she was the queen. He, he could never really accept that. So between the two of them, it didn't take long before they started bickering and it, things just descended from there. Uh, but she found that she was expecting a baby. And in the meantime, the Protestant lords saw an opportunity, even though Darnley was Catholic, that's one of the reasons why Mary was happy to marry him, the Protestant lords in Scotland saw an opportunity to use him, Darnley, to take over. Um, so what they did was they uh, got Darnley to help them to invade the palace and to kill Mary's closest advisor who was Riccio. He was a um, an Italian musician on the surface but underneath he had a lot of contacts in Europe and everything and he advised her. Um, and Riccio was, was killed. Uh, but then after that happened Darnley found himself in a precarious position because he realised well, Mary convinced him that he'd been used by the Lords just to um, take her advisor, not, not to put him into any particular position. Because once the baby was born, why would they need Darnley anymore? They'd have a prince that they could back and they, you know, give, find a regent for him. Anyway, so they escaped, to cut a long story short, because this seems to be going on a bit. <laughs> Um, Darnley ended up staying at a house somewhere and now comes on to the scene James Hepburn now James Hepburn had always been he was a, a Scottish borderer uh, very 
rough sort of character. Uh, he just took women where he felt like it. Um, he had what you might call animal magnetism. That's what he had. And Mary fell under his spell. <laughs> I think after, after Darnley, who was quite, oh, what's the word? He liked the finer things and he was quite, uh, well, for want of a better word, he was a bit effeminate, for want of a better word. Uh, which in those days probably didn't go down too well in the in the Scottish court, as you can imagine. But she liked him because, of course, he had the fine ways and everything to begin with. But Bothwell was the complete opposite. And most likely, uh, that's what happened with Mary. She went from one extreme to the other. So he'd always been in the background, uh, James Hepburn. But I think she sort of didn't look at him in that way. Uh, until her problems and he sort of came along and basically said look I'm a fixer I'll I'll get rid of Dar well there's a bit of conjecture about whether or not he actually told Mary what he was going to do with Darnley but um, what happened was he basically blew the house up that Darnley was in that's the theory and unfortunately for him James Hepburn, it didn't work out quite as well as he thought because Darnley survived, he ran out into the garden, so then he had to be strangled and that's where it became uh, even more of a sensation than it was because um, it was obvious that he'd actually been killed and he was nominally the, the Scottish King, even if it was only in name. So. Elizabeth, of course, back in England, was horrified by all these goings on and expected Mary to distance herself from Bothwell, who was James Hepburn. He was the Earl of Bothwell. Uh, but Mary, instead of doing that, um, married Bothwell after about five months. Now, there are people that say, oh, well, she didn't actually want to marry him he abducted her took him off to his castle had his wicked way with her and then you know forced her to marry him but other people historians say she was only staging the abduction to explain why she married him so who knows <laughs> but it was probably a little bit of both because i think she did find him irresistible uh, that that was the part of him that's you know spoke to her anyway so we'll get through that now let's see if I can of course the nobles in Scotland were never going to accept this situation at all so there was uh, a big war well not a big war but just you know a way of getting rid of Bothwell so it all came to a head and Bothwell agreed to leave Scotland. Uh, and Mary uh, thought that when Bothwell had gone, she would again take over as queen. Uh, but it didn't work out that way. Once Bothwell was gone, James Hepburn had gone overseas in exile, she found herself, of course, without any support at all because he'd gone, he had a little army of his own but he was no more uh, as far as Scotland was concerned. So she then found herself uh, in the situation where she was no longer needed because she'd by that time had had James, her son. And so her half brother became regent to James, Mary's son, and Mary was taken prisoner and ended up in Lochleven Castle. And that's basically few things happened apart from that to try and sort things out. She was forced to abdicate while she was in prison. I think it was Ruthven came and put a knife to her throat and insisted that she sign the, abd the abdication uh, papers. And a less courageous woman may have just accepted her fate and just stayed imprisoned there. But Mary was a very courageous person and she tried to escape a couple of times. One, she was uh, disguised as a, a laundry worker 
because the laundry used to come over from the mainland you know clean and then go back dirty and used to be cleaned on the mainland and sent back again and she got halfway across and the boatman saw her beautifully slender fingers and realized that that wasn't a washerwoman so rowed her back again but she did end up escaping and when she got to the mainland she had two choices she could have gone to France or go to England where she thought she had her cousin who she thought was a supporter of hers now in reality she probably couldn't have gone back to France anyway because Catherine Medici that was the one that I mentioned before Henry's second's wife she wasn't going to tolerate Mary being there so I think Mary real realistically she could only go to England so she went to England expecting assistance and of course that didn't happen she was incarcerated there for 19 years and this is where we come to the stitchery of Mary now you might think that when why would Elizabeth incarcerate Mary when they were cousins they were queens why didn't she help her to get her kingdom back and I think that's the thing against the historical times that Elizabeth Elizabeth was Protestant and always had that illegitimacy um, hanging over her head the Catholics didn't think she was a legitimate queen because they didn't recognize her mother's marriage to Henry and that's a whole other story um, and Mary was Catholic and Elizabeth naturally enough always felt that she would Mary would be the focus of any Catholic groups that were going to try and assassinate her and replace her with Mary so from Elizabeth's point of view Mary was always going to be a big problem for her so she spent most of her time trying to make sure that Mary didn't get away with any plots or anything like that and Mary at the same time was feeling particularly put out because you know why would her cousin do this to her she she wasn't worldly wise in that way uh, Elizabeth had been used to surviving she had to survive from a very young child when she was declared a bastard and had to live away from court and um, she'd always been oh, I've got a something here to show you about that actually just to show you how smart Elizabeth was even at a young age now uh, when her sister took power because what happened was when Henry died he left the throne to Edward and Edward was a Protestant that was that went okay but then Edward died so then Mary Tudor came along and she was Catholic and she tried to change the whole of England back to Catholicism again um, and that was about five years that's when a lot of people were burnt and it was just the reign of terror really she was called Bloody Mary because of it but then Elizabeth took over from her and brought it back again to Protestantism <laughs> anyway when Mary was on the throne as Mary Tudor you can imagine that Elizabeth was in a particularly precarious position because Mary Tudor knew that if she died without issue Elizabeth would be queen uh, so she tried to get uh, charges of treason put against Elizabeth in order to have Elizabeth executed and a group from Mary Tudor came to take Elizabeth to the tower because there was a rebellion uh, by Thomas Wyatt and Elizabeth was connected to it but she didn't ever say that she was and there was no proof however uh, she wrote a beseeching letter to her sister asking her to uh, you know not to jump to any conclusions and all this sort of thing as she was being carted off to the tower and this is the letter that she she wrote Wait till I just do this right she wrote this 
rather long letter. Sussex, who came to get it, he, he allowed her to write it out, which he always was grateful to him for. But she realised that there was a gap under where she'd written that something could be added to. Now, she was only 20, and look what she did. She put all those lines there to make sure that nothing could be added that would incriminate her in any way. And then so quickly was she trying to sign her beautiful signature that she blotched it there. But this is the sort of um, survival instinct that Elizabeth had developed over the many years that she was at the English court. Now Mary, by contrast, was indulged at the French court. So she didn't ever develop those skills. I mean, maybe if she had it, things may have been different for her. Okay, so that's just a little background of Mary. And I'm just going to show you the, the pictures just to give you a bit of an idea of who these, what these characters looked like. And then we go on to the stitching, finally. Gosh, this might be a long one. I hope I can get it all done in this one. Now this, that was Mary's half-brother. And it says here, James Stuart, Earl of Moray, the eldest of James V's children, Moray had every quality needed to make a great king except one legitimacy. <laughs> and this is from the book Mary Stuart Scotland. Okay. Then Lord Darnley. This is just to show that was Mary's second husband. He's there with his younger sibling. But as you can see, he was quite the dandy. Very good looking. And then we have Mary when she arrived at the Scottish court. The Queen of Scots is the most perfect child, enthused Mary's future father-in-law on her arrival in France. This anonymous portrait shows the child who captivated the French court. And why wouldn't she have? delightful. And there, that is Francois, the one that she was going to be marrying. Then we have, oh I'm just going to show you Mary's mother and you can see where she got her beauty from. There's Mary of Guise. very valiant woman as well. Wasn't afraid to get on the battlefield. And then we have a picture of Mary's son James, this young one here. And I think the other one, the Earl of Morton. Oh yes, he, he was one of James's regents there. Yeah. Then, <clears throat> excuse me, this is just a picture of, that there used to be a house, that's what was blown up, and that is Darnley, after he was strangled, that's when all the things really went pear-shaped for her after that. Then, during her captivity, Mary Seaton was the only one that stayed with her the whole time. They all, you know, stayed with Mary in imprisonment, chose that life to be with her. But Mary Seaton stayed with her to the end. And I have a picture of Mary Seaton here. There she is. And she only left Mary after Mary, I'm not sure if it was after she died, I think it was, and she went over to a convent in France. That's Mary Seaton. Um, right, we're nearly to the end of this and we can get on to the stitching. 
Oh yes, I thought you might like to have a look at the uh, the bit of the rough that Mary was so keen on. <laughs> That's him there, James Hepburn Bothwell. And I suppose he does look a bit like an action man, doesn't he? That one next to him was his wife that he had for a while, but he, she, uh, I, basically he married her for money, shall we say. Now here's Lochleven Castle, where Mary was imprisoned, and that's where she escaped from. And what have I got here? Oh, well, of course. And there's just a picture of Elizabeth in all her finery. The light's a bit glary today. All right, so that those are all the characters on the stage. And now we get to the stitching. Now, Mary was in a place called Chartley for a long time and she was with Bess of Hardwick, who was a stitcher. And they worked on this and I'll just show you the, that's it in its entirety. And all those pieces were appliqued onto it. Now, this is at Oxburgh Hall, and it's one of the hangings. At the time that the Hardwick panels were being carried out, Mary Queen of Scots was in char the charge of the Earl of Shrewsbury. She was under his guardianship for 15 years, from 1569 to 1584. Despite the strain and expense of being responsible for Mary, Shrewsbury was happy to report this queen contriveth daily to resort unto my wife's chamber, where, with Lady Lewiston and Mrs. Seaton, useth to sit working with the needle. The enforced association of Bess and Mary was initially eased by their mutual love of embroidery. Mary's superior education and her French upbringing brought new horizons to Bess, and her embroideries began to reflect the taste of the Scottish queen for working small panels, it would be reasonable to suppose that at this point Bess and Mary were planning and working together on the small embroideries which make up the Oxburg, Oxburg, I should say, hangings. These hangings consist of three large panels of green velvet to which numerous embroideries worked by Bess and Mary have been applied. They not only account for the major surviving portion of embroideries which can be unquestionably attributed to Mary, uh, Queen of Scots, but also indicate the staggering proportions of the output of embroidery that Bess and Mary achieved together. Okay, so that's the whole hanging, which I've just shown you there. And then we're going to go on to some of the details. Now, a lot of the uh, workings were from wood blocks. Gosh, I've got that bright light on me. Sorry about that. That's a bit better. Um, but some of them were more freehand. And here's one that's a tiger. And this is from. A Treasury of Embroidery Designs, Jill Spears and Sigrid Quemby, Charts and Patterns from the Collections. That's, it really is a lovely book. So that was that one. Then we go on to a little bit more detail here. Now this particular one is Undoubtedly Mary's, because there are some of them, you're not sure if it was Bess Hardwick or whether it was Mary that had done them. Now, there's that's the wood block there that Mary copied, which is there. So 
So this is Mary's, Mary's work. And she charted that all out herself from this wood block here. So she was obviously artistic. Now, I've just got a little bit of information here. Uh, let's just hang on a tick. The large Elizabethan house employed a number of skilled craftsmen. The broiderer, who belonged to a company, was hired either to start a project or to work in the house for a specific period. It is known that Mary, Queen of Scots, employed a professional broiderer, although she herself was a famous needlewoman. Among the pieces almost certainly sewn by her are the Oxburg hangings, which were worked with Mary Sh Elizabeth Shrewsbury, known as Bess of Hardwick, where Bess's husband, the Earl of Shrewsbury, was Mary's jailer. And on it goes. Now, the designs were taken from woodcut prints, probably found in several different books of beasts. Some resemble the prints of Conrad Gesner, published in 1560. During her 14 years of captivity, Mary worked many other types of embroidery. So, that's without repeating myself there, I think that's all in that book. And then we have another one here. Oh yes, no, that's just here. There's a picture of the phoenix rising out of the flames. And that was her mother's cipher. And this is from Traditional Embroidered Animals, Milner Craft Series, Sarah Don. Um, and this is a rather magnificent one here. It's called the Thirsty Jackdaw. And the legend or the story is that there, oh, yeah, just there, there are little rocks in there. And the jackdaw used to just dropped the rocks in the water because he couldn't get to the water. So if he dropped the, enough rocks in, the water would rise for him to have a drink. Now here too is the wood block. And I'll show you the, the cat that Mary did based on that wood block. And that's just here. There. And if you look really carefully, you'll see that there's a mouse there. And Mary said that Elizabeth I was the cat and she was the mouse. Oh, and there's a coloured picture of the... Oh, gosh, here we go. <laughs> Sorry, I put these on. I was on a winner. Oh, there it is. That's a coloured picture of the phoenix I showed you. Mary of Guise's symbol. It's really amazing. And then there's just some more details from that very large piece I showed you that the ladies worked on. And that's Mary's cipher um yes now what's the other thing i had here just a few more details now this is from the marion hanging which is what that big one that i showed you is called from oxburgh and this is from piece work needlework and history hand hand in hand uh, yes September October 2001 <laughs> so it's a, it's a while 
Um, and I got it because it had something about Mary in there. And here, I'll just read to you what this one's all about. It's full of symbolism of Mary's predicament. She sent this, it's a cushion, uh, but she sent it off to the Duke of Norfolk. Now he was Catholic and Mary was hoping that he might marry her and you know release her from captivity and maybe they would rule England together if, if Elizabeth could be dealt with. And it says of the three surviving hangings, the Marian hanging is the most associated with Mary. Veresit vulner virtus. The centre square has the motto, virtue flourishes by wounding. A hand reaches down through the clouds. There's the hand there. Uh, in the sky between two fruiting trees. Uh, the hand is holding a pruning blade and is cutting down the unfruitful branches of a vine. Um, this was one of Mary's secret messages sent as a cushion cover to the Duke of Norfolk, who was involved in a possible plot to free Mary. Here is the message. The unfruitful branch of the royal house, Elizabeth, was to be cut down. The fruitful branch, Mary, mother of a son already, would be left to bear more fruit, sons. Norfolk was eventually executed for treason. So, that was one of the reasons why I went into Mary's life a little bit, to make this make more sense to you. But I mean, there's so much on it that you can go and have a look yourself. Um, oct octagonal embroidery of marigolds reaching towards the sun with the motto non feriora secutus, not following lower things, and Mary's cipher, part of the Marian hanging attributed to Mary. And there's another one there. That's lovely. So, that's that one. Now I think we're coming towards the end now. Thank you for bearing with me this long if you have, because I realise it's a bit of a mammoth one for me. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm just checking here because I just put a few notes down. Now, I think one of the personal things about Elizabeth was, people said, oh, you know, her favourite, Lester, Dudley, oh, you know, she probably had intimate relations with him and all this sort of thing. Now, I think really some people get a bit carried away because the court days, Elizabeth was never on her own. She always had her ladies in waiting anyway. That's number one. Number two, Elizabeth was a very, very smart person. And she had seen what had happened to Mary when she had a son. Mary was not needed anymore. And also what had happened to her own mother. So therefore, in my view, Elizabeth would never have even risked getting pregnant in any way at all, regardless of how passionate she felt about someone. Whereas Mary, she was different. She was softer. And she just came from a different place to Elizabeth. That's just a personal opinion. Now, I did end up stitching uh, Mary, but I wouldn't stitch her like this again. This was from the New Stitches magazine. It was, someone gave me, they knew I liked Tudor and, and Mary, so they took these out of their magazine and gave them to me. I've got the wives as well, which I'll do on another occasion. Um, this was the picture that the chart was taken from. I'll just get a bit closer there so you can see it a bit better. And here is my picture. Now, when I first 
looked at the chart or the pic I thought that's out of proportion you know her legs go on forever but then the geezers were all very tall people she was six foot Mary which came as quite a revelation to me I didn't realize and I think that Mary would not want to be depicted this way I mean see it was before I got home oh, and see oh, no it just I don't I mean a tribute to her yes I mean I'm glad that someone that she has been charted but still my opinion is this is how Mary would have liked to have been depicted and I think it shows her in her you can see that she would have been very attractive to men and she had charisma and she inspired great loyalty you know her women staying with her all through her imprisonment even at Tutbury she was at Tutbury at one stage and that was a terrible place it had moisture running down the walls it was bitterly cold and it was right on top of the sewers it must have been disgusting but they stayed with her and different men used to come and visit her in captivity and everything but the interesting thing too is that Mary left Mary is the one that actually united the kingdoms of England and Scotland because Elizabeth died without having any children and Mary left her son and um, James the sixth of Scotland became James the first of England and that's how the two countries united under her son so Mary did so she provided stability in the end even though her life had been anything but stable <laughs> and just one more thing before I finish this person here Jean Plady that's my my Mary bookmark she's at least she's smiling in that one um, Jean Plady, she died in, in the 1990s, but she wrote historical novels that a lot of people say were very close to accuracy. And this is the one, The Royal Road to Fotheringay. There are two in the series. This is the second one um, of Mary. And uh, just in case anyone was interested in, you know, finding out a bit more about about um, Mary and those are all the books that Jean Plady has actually wrote while she was alive right well that was the shortened version of Mary's life I hope I've brought her alive to you a little bit um, you know my butterfly scarf seems to want to fly away <laughs> uh, I was a bit daunted presenting this yeah, because I wanted to do Mary justice I wanted to convey the remarkable woman she was um, she had flaws but we all have flaws and really she wasn't dealt a good pack of cards you know I mean to be up against two of the most formidable women, Catherine Medici in France and Elizabeth. I mean, that's, and plus a half brother that was not going to be supporting her. Um, considering all the odds, um, she, she did what she could with what she had in the times that were presented to her. Let's put it that way. So thank you very much if you stayed this long. I look forward to seeing you next time and happy stitching to everybody. Goodbye from Stitch Bliss Corner. <laughs>